thank you, Dr. Freelander. That was very educational. Um, my slide set will go into a little bit less uh, neurobiological detail. Um, but I thought I would take a few minutes um, and have a little conversation about um, insights that we've made from um, different animal brains. And actually, maybe not animal brains, but certain features that help support um, the, the neurological processing of particular animals. And I'm going to focus on two that I thought um, were good examples. So one of them is one of the most exciting examples in neuroscience, not really, but the lobster. So <laughs> lobsters live um, underwater 300 feet below the surface of the ocean, and they kind of chill out there, bury themselves in the sand, and uh, rely on their vision in order to identify their prey in order for them to get a meal. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what helps them do this. So unlike the human eye, which uses um, refracted images that have to be interpreted by the brain, the lobsters see direct reflections that are uh, focused to a single point. So first I'll just talk about human, human vision very briefly. So we have a very uh, elegant visual system. So when we're looking out you know, at the world, let's just say we see a candle, that image is refracted through a lens and it's focused onto the retina. And the retina, if you've come to other brain schools, you will know it's a very sophisticated, um, you know, piece of, of neurobiological tissue. There are cells in there that are gonna process all kinds of information about um, the color of the object, whether you're looking at something that's moving, for example. All of that information is processed, sent along the optic nerve. Is this the pointer that you're using? Okay. Um, it's sent along the optic nerve to the brain, and the brain goes through multiple stages of processing this image. So ultimately, what we see is a very, um, detailed, beautiful vision of the world. The lobster, on the other hand, does not really need to have that sort of um, image of the visual world. What they want to do is identify um, something that's good to eat, something that's um, living in that murky water, and they want to go right after it. And what enables them to do this? Well, they have these really, really cool eyes. So, um, so in lobster vision, they have these square tubes that are like mirrors that reflect the incoming light. And they have about 10,000 of these facets, and all of these operate like tiny eyes. So instead of a lens that refracts the image onto the retina, these are using reflection. Um, so these narrow cells are able to capture a very tiny amount of light, um, but capture it from many different angles. And each of the, these rays of light are basically being reflected down these squares, kind of like um, uh, skipping, a, skipping a stone along the water. So very, at very shallow angles. And as you can see here, um, the way that this is organized is light can be captured from a wide, um, a wide space and focused down to a single point. So this is very advantageous for the lobster. And why am I telling you about this? Because it doesn't really sound very exciting that they're able to have this boring visual system and um, eat their prey. Well, this has actually been inspirational for a number of different types of designs. So this is a really useful tool for focusing x-rays. So unlike visible light, x-rays, they don't bend. Um, they don't like to bend, so they're very difficult to manipulate. So when you put your, uh, your lugs through the x-ray machine, you have a very clunky machine that's basically zapping lots of x-rays um, into your luggage. So um, the Department of Homeland Security for example, has already invested now millions of dollars in the design um, of a, a particular type of x-ray. It's almost like an x-ray flashlight, but it uses this um, lobster vision technology in order to um, take the, uh, provide a smaller amount of x-ray radiation um, through any kind of wall or, um, or packaging. So they've been able to look at three inch steel walls and focus the reflected x-rays um, using this lobster technology to be able to um, provide this very sensitive x-ray equipment. Um, so one of these devices is called the, the Lexid. So again, it shoots um, a stream of low power x-rays through the object um, and has a, a nice image of what's um, being used on the other side. And so uh, really this was designed um, in order to serve as a security tool so when lots of shipping containers are coming into the ports that very easily you can see what might be hiding behind the walls. 
So, um, so what's another way that this can be used? Well, it can be used in wild, wide field imaging. So, um, so the lobster detector, as it's been dubbed, um, can also use the x-rays from outer space, entering into these tubes at multiple angles. Um, and this has actually been a tool that's been used um, by NASA. It's been up on the International Space Station, and they're able to detect um, very rare high-energy photons that are produced through things like black holes, uh, ne neutron star mergers, supernova, um, and even gamma ray bursts. Um, so this has also been a complementary tool that's been used, you probably heard in 2016, that, um, that the, the gravitational waves from a black hole were detected. And so this is, a, this is also a secondary way of, um, of visualizing the X-ray radiation that is emitted from, um, from events such as that. All right. So another example of um, it, an interesting way that um, we're able to look at the structure of the, a brain, and not necessarily of the brain, but of the support structure for the brain, um, is the woodpecker. So how many of you have seen a woodpecker in action? Or heard a woodpecker in action? Hopefully not in your house. All right, so you know they can, they can peck really fast. Um, and maybe you don't realize, but they can actually do rapid fire pecking of 20 pecks per second, and somehow not injure their brains. So how on earth is it that they do this? So the force that they produce is 1,000 times that of gravity. So that's 20 times greater than what would normally be um, causing a concussion in human beings. Um, and I just want to point out that if you want to learn more about traumatic brain injury or concussion, please, there will be another, um, another brain school night where that will be the, the topic of the night. So how do they, pre how do they prevent injury? So there was one study that was published that found that 99.7% of that impact energy didn't go to the brain, it went to the body. And actually, it wasn't even transferred as vibration, but rather heat. So how does this happen? So another group at UC Berkeley, they studied video and CT scans of the bird's head and neck and found that it has four structures that are able to help it absorb that shock. So one is that it has a hard but very elastic beak. So that helps absorb some of the vibration. It also has a springy tongue-supported structure that extends behind the skull called the hyoid bone. Um, we all have a hyoid bone, but it is very different in these birds. I'll talk about that in a second. They also have uh, an area of spongy bone um, in its skull. And then there's an also an interesting way that the skull and the cerebral spinal fluid interact in order to su suppress the vibration. So first of all, this hyoid bone, um, what is it? It is this extra long bone. So it basically goes from the bird's beak the, at the very top. It wraps around its head, splits in two behind its neck, and then connects back up at the tongue. So as this bird is pecking, its tongue is pushing forward in the beak, and it's basically creating a seatbelt for the head. Um, so that's helping uh, prevent some of that, that impact. So I think that that's one thing that's really cool. Um, also, at the base of the beak, um, the beak and the skull are separated by the spongy, spongy bone. So that's not common in birds, but it is found in these woodpeckers. Um, so this spongy cartilage acts as a shock absorber during these repeated blows. In addition, um, in, in this spongy bone, there are what are called um, trabiculae, which are tiny projections of bone that form a mesh um, that, is, um, that forms this spongy bone plate. So it's, um, it's, a very, um, it's a very unique component to these types of birds. So in addition, they also have thick, thick muscles that diffuse the blow, and they also have a third inner eyelid that prevents their eyes from bulging out as they're pecking. Um, <laughs> so this is all pretty cool. So, so, who, so who cares about this? Well, a lot of people care about this because um, we want to prevent damage to our own brains. Um, but also damage to things that some people find are more valuable than their brains, which are their electronics. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> each one of these components of the woodpecker, of this protective system in the woodpecker, um, can kind of be mimicked if you think about what are the, what are the ways that you can apply um, our technologies, apply material science to forming these kind of protective 
um, protective barriers. So for example, this spongy bone that I told you about. Um, when you're trying to protect electronics, um, it's possible to use glass beads um, to, as that uh, shock absorber so that you can protect the electronics. Um, for the beak, um, people are trying to use an outer case and for the skull, you can add a second aluminum layer to help as this double layer of shock absorption. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight this hyoid bone, this very unique feature. The best we've been able to come up with so far is utilizing rubber, but it's so far been very effective in absorbing a lot of that, um, that shock that can happen when you are dropping your electronics, for example. Um, and so these kinds of technologies are going to be particularly important for electronics that are going to receive um, a large amount of uh, a very high impact. So for example, um, the, the data recorder, um, when you've all heard of some recent plane crashes where, that, um, where the flight data recorder has been really important for figuring out what happened, you really want to have a strong shock, shock absorber in that case. But also this technology or this um, biomimicry um, can be used to design things like better helmets. So and this is just one example of one industrial designer that looked at this spongy material and thought, you know, maybe we can design a better helmet that is even lighter weight by trying to create this similar structure with materials. And actually the material that turned out to be most durable was cardboard, um, corrugated cardboard. But in this particular helmet model, the laboratory tests showed that the, the liner absorbed three times as much force as your standard polystyrene helmets. So I'm sure there are better helmets to be designed, but um, these are just a couple of lessons that show if you turn to nature and you turn to these kind of weird things, weird features that these, these animals have, and, and then you use your ingenuity to try to mimic what they're doing, um, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of technology, protective devices, um, and who knows, who knows what else. Um, so I'm just checking the time. Okay, so I have 10 minutes. Um, there were a couple of honor, on, what I'm calling honorable mentions. They're animals that I thought were really cool, but I couldn't really think of a way that, th that um, we've been able to mimic <laughs> what it is that they do. But, um, so I think that the way that they're inspirational is really for us to understand that there are multiple ways, as Dr. Freelander said, that animals can experience the world and that they can adapt to use whatever is out there um, to help them become, um, you know, to, to help them stay alive, to help them evolve. Um, does anyone know what this is? You should, because it says it up here. Du the duck bill platypus. This was my favorite animal as a kid and <laughs> Uh, just because it was really weird and I never really understood what it was. Um, and I think that this is a good example to highlight because in addition to those sharks um, that can sense electricity, the duckbill platypus can also sense electricity. And um, I, I think it may be the only um, uh, non-fish that um, is able to, or non, uh, I don't know what, how, how you would phrase that. Um, Yes, well, the only non-fish, non-swimming creature um, that is um, able to detect, detect electricity. So on its beak, it has 40,000 electroreceptors. And so those are arranged in a series of stripes. And um, the way that it detects ele um, electricity from, for example, um, as Dr. Freelander indicated, you know, muscle movements that are gonna emit electricity is, um, is by, pointing their, um, their snout in the axis of greatest um, sensitivity, which is going to be outwards. Um, and so what they do is when they receive this electrical input, they have this um, reaction where they're going to make these short saccades. And so as they're making these saccades, they're continuously honing in. It's like their, um, their bill is an antenna, and they're honing in on this um, electrical signal. So one important thing to point out is that in addition to this electrical signal, the, be the bill also has mechanoreceptors. And so it's receiving input from these mechanoreceptors, so as its prey is swimming along in the water, it's going to be um, moving the water towards the beak, and it's going to be detected by the mechanoreceptors. And that is going to be a delayed response. 
So both of these types of receptors are sending information back to the brain, which is basically comparing the timing of the two signals. And it's believed that these two signals integrated are providing the information that allows the platypus to hone in on its prey. All right. And the other honorable mention is another one of my favorite animals, um, my most hated animal, which is the pigeon. Um, so the pigeons have an internal GPS system. And this is basically by following the magnetic fields um, on the planet. Um, so it's really interesting. It was, it's been known for a while that they're able to sense magnetic fields, but it wasn't clear how important this component was towards uh, navigation. So um, in recent years, there was an interesting experiment that was done by some Russian scientists where they took um, a bunch of migrating birds um, that were going from the Baltic um, and, and migrating northward. And so what they did was they took these birds mid-migration and then moved them three to 600 miles east. Um, they let the birds continue to migrate. And what happened was the, the birds turned west, westwardly and continued on to the destination that they intended to go towards. Um, so they were able to use this um, magnetic, um, basically the hypothesis was that they were able to sense the magnetic fields and go towards their, their target. So then they repeated the experiment where they basically took these birds, um, took the birds as they were about to go and migrate, and they put them in a magnetic box and they simulated the magnetic field that these birds would sense if they were three to 600 miles east. Um, and so when the birds went to migrate, instead of going to their destination, they turned west because they thought that they were in a different place on the planet. So this was really strong evidence that, uh, you know, of the importance of this magnet magnetoreception for the, the migration of the pigeons. So how is it that they're able to do this? We don't know too much about how the pigeons are able to do this. So at one point, um, the focus was on these iron deposits, so magnetite that's found on the beak. And the thought was that they were functioning as med magnetic sensors. But in later experiments, it was found that they really were not magnetosensitive neurons in the beak. Um, it was later found that there are cells actually in the inner ear, in the vestibular system, um, in an area called the Legina, that seems to encode for information on the mag magnetic field's direction, the intensity, and the polarity. So that's one candidate in the ear. Um, and then there are also cells in the eye that are thought to be um, encoding signals um, related to magnetic fields. So how all of these systems work together is not entirely clear. But we do know that if you look into the brain itself, there are parts of the brain that um, are able to respond to these magnetic fields um, at a strength of 50 to 150 microtesla. And so these are in the, the parts of the brain that, res that are involved in the vestibular system, so, so balance um, in, in the thalamus, so that's responsible for um, sensory processing, the hippocampus, which is responsible for both learning and memory and for encoding information about space um, and the, the visual hyperpallium. All right, so I wanted to, I think I kept that right at about time and I think we'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks, Audra. So we're both here. If there are any questions, we're glad to <clears throat> field a few if we can answer them. Floor is open. Yes. Would you stand up so people could hear? Oh, sorry. OK, either one. Let, let him go first. Sorry.
I think, I think you dreamed part of it, but I think the rest of it's quite accurate. So, so no, you're, very, you're, you're on to a very good point. As it turns out, as you go through depth in the water, uh, there's a tremendous filtration of different wavelengths of light. And as a matter of fact, you can look at the whole spectrum of fishes. One extreme are the blind cave fishes, Astyonyx. Uh, and so there are blind cave fishes in Mexico and South America, some that live uh, all the way back in total darkness and are truly blind, and their eyes are degenerate to those that live right at the mouth of the caves, where there's very low light, but a little bit of light, uh, and they have very small eyes, and they're very sensitive to the wavelengths that just come in there. And then as you go uh, to pelagic fish and you work your way through depth in the sea, what you'll find is you do what's called microspectrophotometry on the molecules in the eye, the fish who live near the surface those versus those very deep. They're very sensitive to different parts of the spectrum that are in that area. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I think, I think we're, Maybe it's a little bit different in terms of uh, non-aquatic uh, animals and the evolution of their visual systems, including primates, of which we are a member, um, that what, what seemed to have happened is the foodstuffs that we are after largely uh, reflect light in certain parts of the spectrum. So just imagine being on the savanna uh, early on and finding your way towards some berries or things like that. And so when you look at the red, blue, green part of the color spectrum that is reflected in that environment, it's right about where we're very good. So my, my guess would be that it has more to do with the coevolution of the foodstuffs available to our species in that particular place. Now clearly, aquatic animals preceded terrestrial animals, and there's a lot to be said for the evolution and conservation of certain visual pigment, pigments as animals migrated onto land from the water. So I, I mean, I think you're, you're, you're on basically to the story there, but these are always tough questions in evolutionary biology, the why that you ended up with something, the best we can do is point to circumstances that seem to make sense and argue for you know, what happened in evolution. I don't know if you want to comment on that as well, Audrey. No, you're the expert there. But <laughs> I think the, the platypus is a perfect example of yeah. how we can be completely confused about you know, how something evolves and then some, some animal shows up with a weird combination of features. Uh, I think you had a question, yep. My question is about your honorable mentions of the pigeon. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. and it's correct, and it's, I don't know that, I mean, I'm not aware of people that are working on that because GPS is always going to be so much more sensitive than the magnetic fields of the planet, but, you know, maybe, I mean, could you imagine if one day we didn't have GPS, um, then, <laughs> and we would all just panic and <laughs> crawl into our caves, but, um, but it, it could be an, another useful tool. There are other, other interesting examples. Otter was talking about the experiments that, was it Russia or Belarus? Mm -hmm. uh, so in, I think it's upstate New York, there are some mountains uh, that have a lot of magnetite lead in them. And experiments have been done to show you can perturb the, the flight of the birds based on the disturbances of the magnetic fields from those areas. So there, there's actually quite a lot of confirming evidence at the behavioral level to show that there's definitely magnetoreception mm -hmm. in the animals. I think the real unknown still, as Audrey pointed out, is the exact mechanism of the detection in the brain. It's gone through what, what people thought was they had it figured out a number of years ago mm -hmm. that you, you showed, but we clearly don't know how they're doing it exactly. But they're definitely doing it. Yeah, so it, it raises a, it's a very good question. It raises a couple of interesting questions. One thing people always ask is how come they don't shock themselves when they generate <laughs> that field? And it, that's actually not known for sure. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple ideas. One is that there's actually a protein on the skin surface that prevent uh, the current from going in except into those little receptors that they have for detecting the field. So those receptors, the electrocytes, are 
scattered, electroreceptors, I'm sorry, are scattered along the body in such a way that the nerves that innervate them, that go up the spinal cord and into the brain, have different times of delay to send their signal to the brain. So as the field is stronger near the tail, that's going to take longer to get to the head than the field in the middle of the body, even shorter yet from near the head, for example. So they're, they're really interesting insulation. It's like a jelly <coughs> substance around them, and they are polarized membranes on cells that are sensitive to the flow of current across those membranes that's funneled into them. And then it gives a signal, like any, any cell, it's going to say, okay, I've been excited. Now I release a chemical neurotransmitter onto a nerve terminal, and then that nerve fires an impulse or an action potential and sends that information up the spinal cord and into the brain. And depending on what part of the body was stimulated, the brain will know how long it took for that information to get up there. So it must have come from here or there or there, whatever it might be. And that's how it figures out which part of the body is being activated. And then when you get something in the field, like the stone that I showed, and it perturbs the field and changes the lines of the current flow, that perturbation will be picked up because it'll change the distribution of the electric field across the body. And those nerve cells will say, okay, there's something at 30 degrees to the right uh, at a distance of X that's interfering with the field and creating that disturbance. I, I left out a very important detail, and I, I, I was just thinking, should I go into this much detail? Oh, yes, okay, what the heck. I'll just tell you. There's also a fascinating phenomenon in the electric fish nervous system that we actually have in our brain as well for other systems. <clears throat> it's called corollary discharge or efference copy. And what that means is when our brain sends a signal to some part of our body to do something, like we send a signal to our eyes to move or our arm to move, we send a copy of that signal, what's called a corollary discharge to another part of the brain that is perceiving the sense of what happened, like did my arm move or did my eyes move, and it compares them to see how accurate. The electric fish does the same thing. When it discharges its electric organ, it not only discharges it, it sends a copy to the part of the brain that's going to sense the electric field to tell it exactly when I sent my pulse out. Now you can compare what's coming in and see how much it's offset. So it's a very sophisticated engineering solution to a problem. You have to know the command you gave, and then you have to measure the feedback you actually got and compare those two to figure out what happened. Hopefully that wasn't too painful, that part. <laughs> <laughs> yes? So then is there a wide could you stand up so others could hear you a little better? Is there a wide variation among different humans how well that coronary uh, works? Yeah. Yeah. So the true answer is I don't know. I don't know that anybody knows that, but I would not be surprised that some of the uh, uh, variance in performance capability in humans in terms of how they control different parts of their motor system, whether it's eye tracking or athleticism and running, it could be due to individual variation and differences in how sophisticated their ability to compute those differences might be. That's a complete made-up answer on my part. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know if Audrey would like to give that one a shot. <laughs> Throwing the hard ones over here. Okay. Uh, there's one here, and then we'll get to you in the back, I think. Could you stand up as well? Well, thank you for the presentation. I, I found it fascinating to see how, by the sort of nature, you know, so many biomedical um, you know, innovations have come out of it. My question is, when it comes to then comparing the human brain to the animal brain, is, is it a myth that we are very similar to pigs? And uh, have we been able in biomedical research to determine uh, you know, the reaction and the responses to social factors and social stimuli by observing pigs or whatever is that animal that is so close to us brain-wise? Uh, I'd be glad yes. to take a shot, but I've been talking like, you want to, you want to take the pig question? <laughs> the um, the I, social I, behavior I, of the pigs and stuff? <laughs> I, I don't know about pigs per se. I mean, humans are very complex creatures. And I think there are a variety of animal models that can, in their own ways, serve as good examples for a particular feature in humans. Often it's a biological feature and not necessarily a behavioral feature. Um, and we do the best that we can in, in biomedical research b because certain animal models, they're easy to um, manipulate in a certain way that we can get at the answer to a biological question, but they may not be ideal for feeding into the same behavioral question because our circuits are very different. So that's kind of a roundabout way of, of answering that question. 
Mike, did you? I don't know. I just said, yeah, I would add, I mean, you're absolutely right. So pig, pigs are considered very, actually, one of the talks coming up later in the week, we'll talk about pigs and studies of, of brain injury, for example. And the reason, as you'll hear, <clears throat> they're used is you're absolutely right. Their head and their brain are much more like a human than, say, a mouse that you would study in the lab, typically, for example. Uh, as a larger animal and so forth. So there are a lot of similarities. I mean, pigs are actually used in a lot of other human-related medical research, like cardiac, cardiovascular research. Their, their heart is much more like a human heart than a mouse heart, for example. So as, as Audrey was saying, different animals give us different windows into different aspects, of, you know, depending on what you're studying. When it comes to social cognition, uh, I don't personally don't know that much about social behavior of pigs. I would not be surprised at all to hear they're very social. Um, <laughs> as a lot of animals are, but there are, there are indeed lots of different animals. Humans are by their very nature a very social animal, and actually we have investigators at the Freeland Biomedical Research Institute who study with brain imaging and a lot of other approaches what's called social cognition in the human brain. And if they were here, they would be the first to tell you that the human brain is elaborated structures that are very much dedicated to perceiving, analyzing social cues from other human beings. We are a very social animal. So, you know, pigs may be a very good model for that. I'm, I just don't know enough about it. There's a question way in the back. Yep. People that keep boas as pets, probably, not so much rattlesnakes, yeah. <clears throat> no, I get your point. So, first of all, I, I didn't go into it, I just kind of concentrated on the rattlesnake, uh, but the pythons and the boas have a different set of receptors. They don't just have those two pits on the face like the rattlesnake does. They have a series arranged along in a line in the face. So by its very nature, the geometry of those creates a different type of a map. And, and the bottom line is, the rattlesnake is the best one. The pit vipers, rattlesnakes, are the best at really using that infrared sense to strike out at a target. The pythons and the boas are much more visual animals to begin with, but they'll use that to kind of generalize where the prey is. But the rattlesnake is the epitome of delivery on target to within just a few degrees of a, you know, usually what could be a lethal bite to its prey. And so the kangaroo rat that evaded capture in those two sequences I showed you obviously <clears throat> had incredibly fast reflexes to get out of the way. And you can imagine that was a beautiful example of natural selection at work. Who knows? It may have been the answer to the question raised up there about maybe they had a good uh, efference copy signal in that particular <laughs> kangaroo rat, and those genes got passed on. And that rat was the Michael Jordan of the rats. That <laughs> it was pretty impressive, I have to admit. Yes, ma'am. There is a phenomenon called battlefield analgesia that's pretty well characterized. Uh, it can be a soldier in war, it can be an athlete on the field. You've all probably seen these situations of somebody who sustains a devastating injury but goes on to win it for the Gipper and play the next few plays or to heroically save somebody on a battlefield even though they may have a broken leg. So that often has to do with a stress response and releasing certain chemicals in our own body that give us a temporary state of anesthesia and well-being and kind of super strength. So, so humans can do that. You're absolutely right about it appears to us that animals, and many animals in many cases, are more stoic uh, about pain than a lot of humans are. And um, <clears throat> I, I think your question is a good one, but a hard one to answer. It's not that those animals don't perceive what we call pain. Uh, it's just that they have had to evolve certain defenses and mechanisms that you know, they need to respond and get themselves out of the way. For anybody who has a dog, it's been socialized living in a home, you will probably notice that dogs that uh, have painful stimuli will whine just like we do, like humans do. <laughs> and they become very socialized and know will respond to their cues, uh, their cries for help, for example. A lot of that is learned behavior. So if you want to 
I'll, I'll just comment to say that the, the actual biology, I mean, the pain receptors, there's no evidence that they function differently. It's really what Dr. Freelander talked about. It's, it's the, the response to the pain. Oh. Yeah. Is it fair to say uh, that? Okay. Good. good. Could you, would you stand up? Okay. Sorry, I'll get to you in a second. Is it fair to say the animal's lack of maybe cognitive or emotional uh, baggage lessens the incident and therefore they can be more stoic? Because they're not thinking, oh, I've lost my arm now for the rest of my life. And you're like, you know, I'm, I'm lying. Self awareness and contemplation yeah, and all that. That is, a, that is an answer that is given. <clears throat> I honestly don't know of the data to support that, though. Uh, it's a hard experiment to do and get rigorous scientific data on. Um, it, it sort of makes sense with a lot of things we think, uh, but I, I think we need to be very careful about that because we don't really have the data on it, I mean, to be honest with you. You know, those great Disney movies where they come home from <laughs> California. First of all, my dog wouldn't find her way home from two blocks away, I just want to say. That. But beyond that, uh, it has been suggested that a lot of mammals actually have the kind of magnetoreception uh, that uh, Utter was talking about, and actually even some humans. So there have been experiments done with humans to blindfold you and put you in a woods that's unmarked, you know, and let you loose, and some people seem to have that special sense of direction and can navigate better than others. Uh, it's, I'd say those experiments are somewhat controversial, but some of it is definitely intriguing. It has been suggested that there are, across the whole mammalia uh, group, um, some ability to have electroreception, so I suppose, or magnetoreception, I'm sorry. Um, I suppose that is a possibility. I don't think olfactory cues, as you said, is those distances are likely to come and play for a dog. It may for a moth, uh, moths can detect a, a molecule at a distance of 1,000 meters or so, but not for a dog. So don't know what it is. That's one guess that uh, could be magnetic field. Yeah, I, I'd be interested. We don't hear anything about the millions of dogs that are that never make it home. <laughs> in other words, in other words we think it's just random. Parents. That one dog just yeah. tried a 1,000 directions and got lucky. <laughs> Could be. Yeah. I, I, don't, I think the evidence is controversial about there being signi a significant level of magnetoreception in mammals beyond like the mole rat, so animals that just live, live deep in the ground and rely on other senses. Um, but I would be curious to know how many lost dogs can statistically travel that far and find their way home. They don't all get into Disney movies. Okay, I think it's getting near the end. Why don't we do one more question and then we'll break, because uh, uh, Mike Fox is waiting with buckets of brains for you. Yes. Well, I didn't know about the first one being true, but I wouldn't be surprised because in reality our visual system is organized with what we call parallel pathways. And if you're not relying a lot on what's called the color opponent process because you're, say, uh, you're red-green colorblind, for example, um, you're, you're likely to uh, emphasize the contrast information. Uh, something called figure from ground separation. It's where you have a, a screen with a lot of dots and noise and stuff and embedded in it is an image of a tank or something like that. And some of us are much better at extracting that image at, uh, than others. And those of us that have normal color vision, I would expect are relying more on color difference cues versus just contrast cues. So I, I wouldn't be surprised to know if people that are colorblind are better at that. I didn't, I didn't know that. And I wouldn't be surprised if the military didn't didn't use it because the military is usually good about using those things. Uh, I'm, not sure, I don't, I'm not sure about the glasses uh, in terms of giving you, you know, it could be taking part of the spectrum and shifting it. I'm, I'm really not sure how those works. Are you aware of I'm not sure how it works, though so. I have seen the videos of the father seeing his children's red hair for the first time. I, 
Yeah, so, so that's very interesting. There's a, there's a great paper in the journal Science published by a gentleman named Mike Loop that has a quotation at the end of it. I'll see if I can remember it. It says, uh, cherries are gray, apples are red. And it was a study of dogs and color vision. And what he discovered and published in that paper was that even though dogs were thought not to have color vision, if the visual stimulus was large enough, they could indeed detect the chromatic differences. And so smaller things trying to detect color, they were not particularly good at it. Uh, and there's also this issue with color of what's called luminance. So even though things may be um, different colors and you think you're responding to the color, you might actually be responding to the luminance of one than the other, how much total light it's reflecting and it looks brighter than the other one, for example. So you can, you can kind of move between the systems that way. Again, I'm really not sure how these glasses work, but it may be taking advantage of one of those principles. Okay, I think uh, we need to let people go. So on the first floor, buckets of brains. And thank you very much. Hope we see you tomorrow night. Thanks,